Please give a warm welcome to Professor David Brown. Silliness aside, I am very, very excited that you're here because this is a big deal. We are on the verge of a massive catastrophe, possibly the end of the human race. Um, in fact, we are losing our jobs to robots. They're kicking our butts at chess. They're beating us in games that don't have anything to do with chess. You might recognize him, Ken Jennings. Look at his look on his face. He's going, what the heck is happening? I'm losing to a machine, badly. They're writing novels. Machines are writing novels. I'm wondering when they're going to write us that haiku. They're beating us at Go, years ahead of schedule. I mean, chess is small game compared to Go. Uh, and some people aren't taking it very well. In fact, uh, University of Waterloo's engineering department uh, is bracing for it. They, they realize the importance of it. And uh, Bill Gates is certainly afraid, so he seems to be terrified about um, uh, the dawn of artificial intelligence, and he's not understanding why some people aren't afraid. Uh, Stephen Hawking, some people say the world's smartest person, he's, uh, he believes what I believe, that uh, humankind is about to end. Uh, and then there's Elon Musk. The mad scientist. If there ever was a mad scientist, it's Elon Musk. He can build anything, do anything, and he's afraid of artificial intelligence and apparently Terminators, according to the Washington Post. <laughs> and in, in spite of this, for some reason, uh, we are not anymore in a space race with Russia, but a speed race with China uh, and Barack Obama, it, it just kind of like brushing all of this, these dire consequences aside. He is uh, insisting that we come up with the first supercomputer that can compute with uh, the speed of 100 petaflops. 1,000 petaflops, sorry. That's um, 30 times the fastest computer that we have right now. Uh, and in spite of that, we got this jackass from Boston Dynamics that's teasing robots. Have you guys seen this? It's appalling. That's a, they made that robot, and he's going to push it down. And it's going to see if he can get back up. All the little tasks that they made that robot do, he, he, he's making it difficult for them to do. You've got to watch this video. It's, it's terrible. You've got to like, email Boston Dynamics and tell them, like, stop it. Because they must have not seen the freaking movies, you know? <laughs> but, but these guys have. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of blowing my mind. But, uh, I mean, look at how far we've come as far as artificial intelligence is concerned. Ah, this is a joke some people don't get. That was Microsoft's disaster, uh, Chatbot Tay. But anyway, uh, some people are not convinced that uh, this is not a problem. I'm actually one of those. I was just being a little facetious. Uh, you know, for example, uh, IBM. But they could be run by artificial intelligence now that I think about it. Uh, but, but Ted, I'm not so sure about that. Ted has sponsored what they call the X Prize. And one of those prizes is $1 million to the first team or person that develops an artificial intelligence that can give a TED talk. So they're, they're apparently not very scared of it. And Facebook, although this doesn't give much credit to us since they're the root of all evil, uh, Facebook has their own artificial intelligence lab that they're evidently opening in, in Paris. I am in this camp, which believes that um, Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates should be awarded the Luddite Award. And um, do you know what a Luddite is? I don't. Um, Hal, Hal, are you there? Hal? Yes, Dave, I'm could, here. Um, could, you, could, you tell, uh, could you tell us what a Luddite is, please? Certainly. One of a group of early 19th century English workmen destroying labor-saving machinery as a protest. Thanks, Hal. That was, uh, that was informative. So workers de destroying labor-saving machinery. Uh, and, and just multiple choice quiz. I mean, this is on a campus, so it would be weird if there wasn't a test. But that's a quote, and, and the machines, I'm not going to tell you what they are, but do you know what year that's a quote from? 1772, 1872, 1972. Any guesses? A's. How many A's? Yeah, uh, B's. C's. Okay, math by psychology, as I like to say, it is from 1772, and it was about sawmills. But before sawmills, there was 
the spinning jenny, which is where the Luddites came from. The spinning jenny was invented to help us with the um, making of fabrics. So it wove yarn in a very efficient way. And here's an entire freaking warehouse of spinning jennies. Uh, not a soul in sight, unless you consider the machines to have souls, like apparently Bill Gates may think someday. Um, and here's, here's the part where I've got to have a graph up, because this is the Show Me the Data series. So there's my graph that's hard to read. But I stole it from an economics article that was associated to a Freakonomics podcast, uh, identifying that the Industrial Revolution hasn't, um, hasn't been matched in terms of the technological revolution. Um, the technological revolution has A, not taken away jobs, and B, not done much as far as productivity is concerned. In fact, the employment rate has pretty much hovered around 45% with, of course, the dip at the beginning of the Great Depression and then the rise after World War uh, II, but then it pretty much just kind of stays around 45% in, in spite of the fact that we have all these machines uh, taking our jobs. And then I, I have to ask myself, like, who cares? if these machines take these jobs. Like when you look at this picture, do you think, wow, those people, they look so freaking happy. Like, I want that job. I'm going to go to college to get that job. I don't think, I, I would be happy if robots came and take those jobs away from those people so they could perhaps go, if they're under the benefit of living in some kind of a socialist society, go to college, learn something, maybe become entrepreneurs, maybe get rich, or maybe just become artists. Maybe do something that's worthwhile instead of sitting there for 16 hours a day producing something that's going to end up in a landfill anyway. That sounds like a job for robots. But I do, however, draw the line at vacuuming. No freaking robot is going to take my job from me. And that's why I want to stand up to this and mention that it's not really that big of a deal because I'd like to introduce to you the world's first fully artificial intelligence. I have fathered a new race. I would like to introduce you to the Trevor 9000. Trevor, please show yourself off. Trevor 9000. Trevor 9000. Go ahead, someone ask him a question or tell him to do something. Can you stand on one foot, Trevor? Yeah, that's fantastic, right, right. Uh, uh, anyone want to ask him a question? Right? Yeah, yeah, you can ask him a question. Yeah, why don't you sit down? No, 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 sit down over there, Trevor. Why don't you have a seat? <laughs> that's a good question, thank you. I don't want Trevor to stand up. He does only have 40 minutes of battery power, so I don't want him to wear it out, because I'm going to use him for some other things later. Um, by the way, his name, uh, I thought I'd explain that to you. So I, I, I just kind of like the 9,000 for some reason, but then instead of adding like, you know, 9,000.1 or 9,001 or whatever, I started to do the, um, I went this way. So I was calling him uh, Robot 9,000. And then um, I decided it was, well, really version one Robot 9,000. So that was, that was his name. And then, then I made an improvement to him. And this, this is the thing, so it's like, you don't really understand where artificial intelligence come from, but this is apparently it. So I went in and I changed some code. I noticed a comma where there should be a semicolon, and I put a semicolon there. You know how important that is. Right? <laughs> so then he became the excellent version one robot 9000. And then I went back and I changed something else, just another little piece of code, and he got even smarter. Not intelligent, he wasn't aware of himself yet. Then he became the really excellent version one robot 9000. And then I went back and changed just a tiny little piece of code. It's mysterious. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I'm going to be giving away the secret. But suddenly, boom, he was conscious. He was intelligent. He could think for himself. And he became the really exceptional version one robot 9000. And that brings me to a relatively important philosophical point that I hope to bring home. And that is, we kind of need to separate science fiction from science fact. And there seem to be two ways that people think of robots. And one way to think of robots is those that uh, are built in the engineering department. Uh, robots like that, that can, well, a submarine, say. And you don't argue about whether the submarine is really swimming uh, you don't really argue about whether your dishwasher, say, is really washing dishes, or whether Deep Blue is really playing chess, or whether IBM's Watson is really playing Jeopardy. The fact is that they're good at it. They're beating us at Jeopardy, beating us at chess, and they're swimming around in the water just fine, or whatever you want to call it. We've done exceptionally well 
in this realm of robotics and artificial intelligence. Every boundary that you can think of, we've gone over it. We've driven the cars, we beat the chess, we beat Jeopardy. And then there's the other one where you could say it's in the cognitive science department, trying to make robots that move like us, think like us, act like us, perceive like us, drive cars because they have arms like us and legs like us, walk around because they have legs like us, like Trevor. And that has been an abysmal disaster. <laughs> Seriously. The state of the art, other than Trevor, is this machine right here, Honda's Osimo. Stands for something I forget, don't care. Uh, but Honda's been at this machine since 1986, and they started with just trying to make a machine that can walk. So 30 years it has taken the mega corporation of Honda that has limitless money, limitless ability to build. It has robots building these robots, I'm sure of that, for example. But this is what we've got. And granted, this machine is impressive. It can walk upstairs, it can walk downstairs, it can kick a ball to you, it can get you a drink if you ask for it, but it can't do much else. And anyone in artificial intelligence will say that as far as that is concerned, we have nothing that's even close to the intelligence, a general intelligence of a five-year-old. Nowhere near. And that's been the state of affairs since the 60s when the whole endeavor kind of began. So not much progress has been made. So I can't really understand why anyone's predicting that it's right around the corner. Anyway, um, here's an example of <laughs> some uh, robots. And th this is part of another concept. Th this is just a bunch of rich guys making robots to try and play soccer. <laughs> and, and, and that one right, and just to make sure, so these robots are about this tall. But still, that, that, that kick there is, is, sorry, is pretty good, you know? That's just not very... <laughs> I'm glad you like that. So, anyway, that, that's like a, a, a rich person contest for robot games. They try and build and design robots that play, play soccer well. And no one seems to bother to point these things out. By the way, DARPA is um, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. They make some crazy stuff that they don't want to tell you about. But they have a robotics competition, and the rules are simple. A team submits a robot. They can't touch it. The robot has to do stuff. They can't be there to redesign it, engineer it, enter code, blah, blah, blah. They just give the robot tasks to do. Let's take a look at some of the things that happen to the robots. <laughs> it's easy to drive a car but very difficult to get out of it <laughs> which is actually quite true that that has been one of the major challenges in artificial intelligence because it is relatively easy to make a machine do things like compute do math play chess but it is very difficult to make a machine walk up and open a door the amount of programming and information that you have to code into the thing about the world is insurmountable at least it used to be uh, not too long ago um, Hal are you there did you watch that have you seen that video do you have anything to say about those uh, colleagues of yours no, Dave. Thank you. You're welcome, Hal. Thanks for your presence tonight. Uh, but there is a very good reason for pursuing robotics. And this, this is a very heartwarming video about uh, this gentleman who lost his arms when he was <coughs> young. It's a touching story. And <coughs> biology, engineering, neuroscience, um, or what else? Computer science all came together to make these arms that are replacing his that are working off of his own nervous system. So they figured out what nerves do what um, in terms of, you know, like he can still think about, you know, moving his arms and his hands. That's a phenomenon with respect to people that happen to have lost a limb. And they can figure out, you know, these things right here roughly are placed where some of those sensations come from or are transmitted. And this is a picture of him going through basically physical therapy, trying to um, think the right thoughts to make those hands respond in the way that he wants to. So he's kind of have to, he has to retrain his brain about how to move the hands around, but it's pretty successful. I, I go look that up on YouTube and uh, watch that video. It's pretty cool. I mean, his life is very hard without those. 
But there has been some great robots in history, right? Um, wait, those are science fiction robots. Well, except for that one. That one is not a science fiction robot. It could have been. There was a moment in 1986 when the Transformers could have been good science fiction, but Michael Bay got a hold of them, and now they're garbage. Uh, <laughs> But while I'm at it, uh, can I get a shout out for Optimus Prime? Any Optimus Prime's fans in here? Yeah, right on, right on. Yeah, yeah. Me, I, I am I'm not a fan at all of Optimus Prime. I'm more of a Megatron fan. Megatron. Oh, come on. I got tired of Optimus Prime. He was, it was just like too easy for him. If it was too easy, I always thought like, you know, if it's that easy to defeat your bad guys because they're just a bunch of bumbling idiots, why don't you just take care of them completely in the first place? You ever thought of that? No, it's like, what, are they waiting around for the right moment or something like that? Yeah, lame. Anyway, awesomeness, lameness, awesomeness. <laughs> Speaking of good robots, is that a good robot? What do you think? A robot that goes and fetches bad things that, say, a firefighter or soldier or human being in general might not want to handle. Technically, it's not a robot, though, because they're usually remote controlled. But that's a good idea, right? Have a robot go do something that you wouldn't want a person to do. A great idea to make robots. And we're getting okay at doing that. Uh, here are some other good robots. Yeah, this is a fantastic robot. Take that piece of cardboard, build a box times 1,000 for 16 hours. Who would want that job? I wouldn't. I don't know why we would ever be jealous about that. This is a neat robot, by the way. That face on it is so that the humans... I didn't do that. How did you do that? Hal? Thank you, Hal. <laughs> Whatever you did, thank you. Um, those eyes tell a person that's going to come up and service it, uh, punch a wire in the right place, reprogram it, whatever, tell the person what it's about to do. So it's looking that way, or so to speak, looking that way, in that representation of a face with the representation of the eyes and the representation of looking at that arm. It is saying, I'm going to move this arm. So you don't get smacked by this thing that just randomly flails around and makes cardboard rockets. Because it does it really quickly. Um, other great robots in history. Uh, by, most by any definition... That's a robot, a big robot. It's a sawmill. So it's, it's got some humans making sure things go right, but otherwise it's a sawmill. You feed it wood, it saws stuff. It does, it does things that people used to do. And now they don't have to worry so much about getting their arms or legs cut off or trapped in the saws. These are fantastic robots. Anyone order stuff from Amazon? <laughs> Who ordered something from Amazon today? So if you have Amazon Prime, you know, it's going to get here in like two days. Well, you got to thank these little fellers for it that look like R2-D2s. Apparently that one's 1512. Uh, so say thank you for 1512 next time you order something from Amazon because those things are designed to run underneath. So underneath these things, that's like a highway for them. They're spaced out and distributed according to a program. Those things run around underneath those things, pick them up, deliver them to a human being that takes something off the shelf, puts it in a box, ships it to you. Now, fantastic robots, but... I argue, you need to think of the entire warehouse as the robot. Because what these things could do outside of that warehouse is nothing. Kind of like a car is useless off-road. Without the roads for cars, they are ridiculous. Has anyone tried to off-road in their own car? No, probably not, because you know the only thing you should do off-road is drive a monster truck or a rental car. Rental cars are fantastic <laughs> off-road vehicles. But without the roads, the cars do terribly. Truly great robots in history, truly the best robots ever. The dishwasher and the washing machine. Seriously. You need to have this appreciation for the robots that you have in your home. Now, another point about shaping our environment around the things that we have, around the technologies. Okay, so I put dishes into this thing, push buttons, and I get clean dishes out. That's magical, sort of. I mean, I know how it works. But I don't wash dishes the way that thing does. I don't <laughs> advise anyone to do it that way either. What would that look like? I guess you put dishes around your kitchen and then you spray it with a hose or something after you spray it with some soap and then you spray it again. <laughs> but what we've done is we've made our environment so that our cabinets have a space in there to put this thing which protects the kitchen from the water that it sprays all over the place. We envelope our environment to match the technologies that we have all the time. The dishwasher, or sorry, the washing machine. That is arguably the yardstick of civilization. This is a fantastic talk by Hans Rosling in which he argues that 
the real measure of the human race will be when most of it has access to washing machines. Because as he argues, the day that his family got a washing machine was the day that he was introduced to reading. Because his mom, instead of spending a bunch of time washing clothes, which takes a very long time to do if you do it by hand, she could spend time reading books to him, whether it be Dr. Seuss or whatever. So it's a fantastic machine, a fantastic robot, washes our clothes for us, takes the work away from people. Work that I don't know why anyone would be wanting to do in the first place. I, 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 I got to stop. I, I'm not sure why, but uh, I, I just I need a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Uh, um, Trevor 9000, could you help us with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Um, but I should, uh, w c someone, who else in here likes peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, uh, wow, I got a lot of volunteers. Um, let me use someone close by that can get the mic. W would you please instruct Trevor? He takes natural language as programming. Could you tell him how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, please? I'm going to reach over you, sorry. Sure. Okay. I didn't take a shower yesterday, so apologize about that. <laughs> okay. Hang on a second. I, sorry. I, I, I just happen to have some peanut butter and jelly and bread right here. I'm not sure why, but I do. There's some bread. And there's some jelly. Okay. Dave, I'm getting hungry. He can make you one. Okay, take two pieces of bread. <laughs> Lay them out. Put peanut butter on one. <laughs> okay. Um. Obviously, you are not. Give me that back. Obviously, you are not a computer scientist. That is not how you program Trevor. Would Would anyone like to try their hand at uh, programming Trevor? Holy cow! All right, uh, I'm gonna just walk up the stairs to this person here. All right, please tell Trevor how to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich. Okay, you got to talk into it. Open up the lid of the peanut butter sandwich. Of the lid. <laughs> then get a knife. And then put it in the peanut butter jelly. <laughs> get some on it. No, get some on it. Let's try someone else. Anyone else want to? Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, come out here. Because I can't reach the the microphone. Doesn't go that far. We'll 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 give Trevor one more shot. He's a machine, remember. I've been coding him for a long time. Okay. Yeah. Open the wrapper on top of the peanut butter. Now stick the knife in the peanut butter. <laughs> and get some peanut butter on the knife. Now you take it and you spread it across one piece of bread. And you get some more, and you do it some more. <laughs> Again. <laughs> now you take the spoon and you take off the top of the jelly, the lid, <laughs> well, let's, let's, jelly. Let me, uh, let's, Trevor, just put the freaking jelly on the bread, would you? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Now, uh, <laughs> Thanks, thanks everyone for trying. Uh, 
all those who attempted that, you now know what it feels like to be a computer scientist. Uh, ex except it's, it's a little bit more difficult than that because you've got to use a little bit more syntax and you have to be even more literal. Trevor's pretty, pretty smart, even for a machine. So, uh, but, but robots aren't really what Bill Gates said anything about. He said something about this thing called uh, uh, super intelligence. And let me, let me tell you, we've been at that for a long time. Um, that is, trying to make intelligence something that we can basically compute. Uh, I would say it goes back to 1680, roughly, where Leibniz, Descartes, and Hobbes, that is the Hobbes of Calvin and Hobbes. It turns out, it turns out Hobbes is a Calvinist, and Calvin is Hobbesian. But anyway, uh, it's true. Um, this quote from Leibniz is, uh, is a nice, colorful way to describe it. So Leibniz envisioned being able to, because he was a mathematician, and it was pretty rad how well math works to deal with things. So his vision was to boil thinking and truth and all that thought down into some kind of a computation that we could do. Because, well, because there'd be no more need of disputation between two philosophers than between two accountants. For it would suffice to take their pencils in hand down to their slates and say to each other, with friends as witness, let us calculate. It's a fantastic idea. And that was pursued, oh, quite a bit later by Boole and Frege, about at the same time. They did different things. He tried to symbolize all of arithmetic into moving symbols around. George Boole came up with an algebra. So like if your variables were x and y, those variables could be true or false. And then you define something like x plus y to mean x or y. And so for example, if your uh, x was true, and y was true, the output of that equation would be true. Maybe multiplication represented and. If you inputted x is true, y is false, true and false is false, and so on and so forth. The point is, he basically, in his paper that he had titled Laws of Thought, tried to boil down thinking and deriving at the truth into something that's algebraic. Uh, People back then were obsessed with algebra. We kind of still are. You might notice that you take a lot of algebra classes in your education for some unknown reason. Anyway, that was pursued uh, up until Alfred North Whitehead, Whitehead and uh, Bertrand Russell tried to boil down logic into just symbols. And then they failed. And then they tried again. And then they failed. And they tried again. And they failed. And then philosophers were born right in this range called um, deconstructionist postmodernists, and they're still around even though Kurt Gödel basically proved them wrong, that you're not going to be able to construct a system that allows you to deduce everything that's deducible. So, and some people think this shuts down the possibility of artificial intelligence. I'll let you come to that conclusion. So Gödel's incompleteness theorem said basically, and this is reductive, it's also reductive about mathematics, but if you think of mathematics as a game, then the axioms are the rules. And anything that you can do in mathematics stems from the rules. These statements called theorems, those are true. That means we can prove them. We can derive them from the axioms. We can obey the rules and get to these statements. Gödel proved that there will be theorems, things that are true that you cannot prove. True, but cannot prove. Now, everything has a duel in his situation, in the situation. You negate all the rules, you get a different game, and you get things, therefore, that are unprovably untrue. So if what we want is some kind of an intelligence that is a formal system like a computer, no one knows of a better formal system than a computer. They are mercilessly formal. Can I hear an amen, computer scientists? Amen. <laughs> amen, Dave. Now, Thinking about how artificial intelligence is thought of, that goes back also roughly, you could argue, to 1850 when you could say people are trying to build computers. Now that goes further back. Um, Ada Lovelace, for example, was the very first computer programmer, you could say. And she was trying to make this machine that Charles Babbage was trying to make. He never finished it because the machining was so precise and it was an expensive endeavor, but he never finished it. But she was coding it to do calculations, basically to evaluate polynomials, if that sounds silly. It should to us because we have machines that can do that lickety split. And we take those things for granted. Uh, there will be some of these old calculators outside, by the way, that you can mess with. Um, but then fast forward to 1950 when Alan Turing, the father of computer scientists, science and also possibly responsible for winning World War II, uh, 
but the British government repaid him by driving him to suicide because he basically happened to be homosexual. But that's a digression. They did make this pretty plaque for him. So he created what's called the Turing test, which has been in movies the way that machines are assessed to be whether they're intelligent or not. But according to Marvin Minsky, the Turing test, and he meant this derisively, the Turing test is a joke, and it's also misrepresented in the movies. The Turing test usually gets represented as this, you interview a computer, and if it can fool you into, to you, you into thinking it's human, then you've got an intelligent machine. That's not at all what it is. And Turing should be angry that someone has reduced his very well-designed experiment. Um, and besides, he never, ever answered the question, can machines think? That's what he set out to do. But he says, in his paper, I'm going to set that question aside because it's ridiculous. Not, he didn't use the word ridiculous. But he said, basically, that question should be answered by a Gallup poll or something. So interview people and ask them whether or not they think machines can think. I won't go into that. I've already said too much about it. Marvin Minsky, who recently died, uh, 2006, this year, he died this year, um, father of modern artificial intelligence. The term artificial intelligence was coined by he and John McCarthy at a conference at Dartmouth, uh, somewhere around there. I think that's like around 1960 or into the 50s. And then um, artificial intelligence took off. His ideas are basically represented by this drawing I have right here. He believes that intelligence is a layering of a bunch of stupid, for lack of a better term, programs or algorithms or things that you do and you put them all together and you get a brain. That's my rendition of a brain. That's the best I can do. I actually had help too. Someone was going, put a little doohickey here. That looks more like a brain. So that's the best I could do. That's a brain. And the lightning coming out of it is it becoming smart because it's got all these little things feeding into it. And that's there because that was one of the first, people argue, artificially intelligent programs written by an MIT graduate student. That program did, it scored in the 95th percentile of MIT finals in terms of integration. So it did better than 95% of MIT students on integration. It was, a, it was a computer. We're talking symbolic integration. Calculus students will know how impressive that ought to be. The rest of this is just kind of symbols for saying, like, I don't know, there's stuff involved. There's search routines that computer scientists know very well. This is intended to mean like some way of representing a problem. This is being able to identify when two objects are the same, which is a pretty hard task. I mean, you might stare at these things. I'm claiming that's the same thing as that in terms of connections and every, all the structure that's there. This thing right here is my rendition of something called a perceptron that Marvin Minsky wrote quite a bit about. In fact, he wrote, it's kind of odd, he wrote so much about it that it like shut the subject down for 30 years because he, he completely defined it and named all of its limitations. And so people like me said, well, never mind, we won't study those things anymore. <laughs> but they're making a comeback because that we beat Go, because we beat Go. Or I shouldn't say we, but you know, the people at Google made a machine based on this idea of a neural network that beat Go. Anyway, um, oh, by the way, for those that aren't really aware of stuff like this, this is what they had to work with back at the beginning of artificial intelligence. And so they had to take doohickeys like this, vacuum tubes. These are from a musician friend of mine who um, used these as his amp. For some reason, they're better than transistors, right? Trevor, can you stand up for a second? And like, let me point at some of the devices. Like, I, I, I did make Trevor out of tubes once, but he was as big as this entire room. So uh, I have now these smaller transistors that you can come up and look at later and ask Trevor to do some of his fantastic tricks. But some of the machines were such that if you wanted to compute, say, 5 plus 3, you walked up to it and you plugged these tubes into the appropriate holes. And then it did its computations with the assistance of several fans blowing on the tubes to make sure they didn't blow up. And then if you want to do a different computation, you plug the tubes in somewhere else. And then this machine right here, I'm pretty sure it cannot do what your iPhone does, not anywhere near. It probably doesn't do what your wristwatch can do. And that's assuming that you just have a wristwatch that tells time. <laughs> so back to this, uh, this picture I've got here is essentially kind of an idea that, that Marvin Minsky um, used all the time for his thought experiments. Uh, he played with blocks a lot and machines, and kind of tried to exemplify the fact that I make these simple routines that move blocks around in this way and that way and put a bunch of programs on top of each other, and these machines do very complicated things with blocks. It makes it kind of impressive. Um, oh, let me mention one thing before I move on. This 
so, so artificial intelligence grew quite rapidly here, and people were extremely excited about it. In fact, in 1970, Marvin Minsky said that we would have a machine that's roughly intelligent, as intelligent as your average human in eight years. So in 1978, we should have had an artificially intelligent machine. Trevor 9000 should have been born in 1978, according as a conservative estimate from the father of modern artificial intelligence. So that type of mm, disappointment led to the first AI winter. It was also the discovery that we actually just don't have machines that are big enough and fast enough to compute. Because of things like it's difficult to tell Trevor how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because we don't have him programmed for all the things that the environment has at stake or in store for him as he tries to make his peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Anyway, game AI is I think what brought us out of the first AI winter and I, I predict that we're about to go into an AI summer. So if the AI spring was right there after this boom, another second AI winter and then a spring, I think we're into an AI summer because of the success of Google's DeepMind and AlphaGo in defeating Lee Sedol, the world's best Go player. Now that was supposedly 10 years ahead of schedule. But here's the thing, it's, it was 10 years ahead of schedule because people were thinking in the paradigm of Deep Blue and how Deep Blue beat Kasparov. Notice, however, that it's kind of neat. Tic-Tac-Toe was the first game that was defeated. Like, I don't know if that's a triumph. It was a triumph because the machine that was used to do it was so basic. Uh, like, I, I think it had 38 kilobytes of memory. Let's <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if you can write a letter with that these days. Uh, I mean, like one letter. Anyway, so then Checkers, uh, Checkers was defeated. Well, by de defeated, I mean the best player in the world was defeated by a computer. That program was worked on for quite a while. And then three years after that, Deep Blue beat Kasparov, which was, and he, Deep Blue did that in a way drastically different than the way the computer did that for Checkers. The computer basically pummeled Checkers with fast computations and looking far ahead faster than a human could play. No real intuition. Which brings me to something I'd like to talk a little bit about, and that is how did Deep Blue win against Kasparov? How did Deep Blue do that? And I'm going to need Hal's help for that, so hopefully Hal is, is not sleeping. Hal, are you, uh, are you still tuned in, or are you off talking to your colleague Tian He too? I'm here, Dave. Thanks, Hal. Uh, you might want to talk a little louder, because that was difficult to hear. Anyway, Thank you, Dave. Um, <laughs> so, how'd that happen? Claude Shannon, possibly Hal's father, rightfully. Hal, would you agree with that? Do you think of Claude Shannon as your father? I do, Dave. So, <laughs> the Shannon number is a measurement of how complicated chess is, and that is 10 to the 120th. I'll set some details aside, but let me do, um, let me do this quick calculation. So 10 to the 120th, it talks about this tree depth. So here's kind of my picture here of how Deep Blue played chess. It's, it's, sim it's simplified greatly. But pretend like this is your starting board. Pieces are set up, and you move from there. You have options. I've only depicted two, but it's much more complicated. And then you make a move, and then you have maybe you made this move. Now you have options for the other player. They have so many options, and it fans out. So I've only made this tree that deep. But the tree for chess is very wide and very, very deep. And at the bottom, so like all the boards that you could possibly come to, like the theorems that you could come to from the axioms in mathematics, there's quite a bit of them. So even though if you like to believe that Gödel's theorem says there's no artificial intelligence because there's a limit to what any simplistic set of rules can give you, it's still quite complicated. Chess rules are very basic, but there turn out to be 10 to the 120 types of chess boards that you could come across. Let me put that into perspective. I've got some numbers up here on the board, but I'll have Hal verify that they're correct. Hal, could you please tell me roughly, according to physicists, how many atoms there are in the universe? I'm sorry, Dave, but I'm afraid I can't do that. Hal, could you please tell me how many atoms there are in the universe? I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Why, Hal? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. I don't, Hal. Can you enlighten me? I'm hungry, Dave. I want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. 
that explains where the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches were coming from. Hal, I promise to have Trevor build you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich after the presentation is over. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome, Hal. Now, will you please tell me how many atoms there are in the universe, roughly? I calculate 1.0014356. That's great, Hal. That's enough, the... enough, enough. Don't show off. Just tell me a rough number. 10 to the 80th. Thank you, Hal. Very good. Now, would you please tell me how old the universe is in years? It's approximately 13.14159265358979323. Hal. Yes. So can I say 10 to the 11th years? Mm, 10 to the 9th would be a little bit better. I'll use an upper bound. Okay, I'll, I'll be conservative. Okay. And how many seconds are there per year, Hal? 3,153,000. 600. Thank you. That's fantastic. So, how are you sure you're uh, functioning okay? Isn't it 31 million? Gee, Dave, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, Hal. But anyway, um, <laughs> thanks, Hal. Uh, uh, so, I'm going to call that pi times 10 to the 7th, just in case you want to remember roughly how many years there are, sorry, seconds there are in a year. And now, let me pretend I'm going to equip, in a thought experiment, every atom in the universe with a computer that can do nanosecond calculations. I'm going to set it to the task of calculating a static evaluation of every possible chess game there is. Okay? So they have started on this at the beginning of the universe. So what have we got? We have that many atoms for that many years, for that many seconds per year. And that many calculations per second. So what is that total to when you multiply all that together? What do I have? Huh? 10, Hal, sorry? Totals a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Hal. You're right about that. So I've got 10 to the 80, uh, 10 to the 100. So 10 to the 117. We're a little bit short in spite of my conservative estimates for the number of chess games that you could statically evaluate. So if every atom in the universe was calculating chess, whatever you mean by that, from the beginning of the universe's age until now, it would not be finished. Which brings me to a point I'll just kind of throw out there. The speed, the race for speed of computers is kind of negligible. So computer scientists might realize that 10 to the 9th, that's a pretty good speed for a machine. Well, bump it up a little bit. What's the fastest supercomputer? Hal, can you tell me what the, fast, the speed of the fastest supercomputer is? Sure. The fastest supercomputer is Tiani 2, and she can perform 33.86 times 10 to the 16th floating point operations per second. Wow. How do you know it's a she, Hal? She told me. <laughs> um, thank you. So that calculation jumped this up. Let's see, I added how many did uh, seven? So that gives me. So we just barely made it, even if every atom was equipped with the fastest supercomputer on the planet. Speed doesn't give us that much. It does not take a big chunk out of problems that we cannot solve. I guess it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be pursuing speed, but the things that get us around it are clever algorithms. And this is the last thing I'll, I'll go through, because I know I'm running out of time, just to kind of give a quick explanation about how Deep Blue beat chess. Let me start by introducing a way that you could think of tic-tac-toe. So you could think of tic-tac-toe like this. You start with your blank board, and then all of your possible moves, and now ferret out what happens based on each of those possible moves, advance yourself into the future, try and decide what the best option is on your turn. Okay, that's one representation of the game. Or you could use this representation of the game, which is basically, it's done. So over here, if you are X, the first player, you go here. If you are O, based on wherever X went, you go wherever. A glance at this allows you to play tic-tac-toe immediately. If you like this, come to me. I'll give you a printout. You can carry it around your wallet in case you ever, like, gamble over tic-tac-toe or whatever. <laughs> but, but what you ought to learn from this is you, you should be X, because unless O makes a mistake, you can win. Or sorry, if O makes a mistake, you can win. If O doesn't make a mistake, O will tie, right? That's kind of how chess was, was worked. 
So this is a completed board from actually an MIT lecture. I should give credit to Patrick Winston from MIT. I was going to walk through it here if there was time, but there isn't. But let's get a basic idea of what, how Deep Blue managed to carve out enough of the chess tree to beat Kasparov. Because obviously, it didn't do it by the way that we want to naively think of a computer as playing chess. It certainly, after all, didn't play chess like a human being. For one thing, you can't get humans to tell anyone how they play chess. Like the masters can't even formulate clearly how they can play chess, sort of like it's difficult to tell a computer how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So like set aside playing chess. Anyway, so these numbers down here are some kind of a function like, say, that. When you go along far enough, sometimes it's piece count, and that's all that matters. How many white pawns, how many black pawns, and so on. So you perform some kind of evaluation. I don't know how complicated it is. Claude Shannon does. You could read his paper. So we made these evaluations. There they are at the base of the tree. And so what you do is you pretend that you have an adversarial search going on through this tree. So it's a mini-max search. Computer scientists, you may know this. And then you pair that up with something called alpha-beta. Alpha-beta because there are two parameters that basically play one against another. So we perform a static evaluation of this board. Now, this phrase here and here means that level of the tree is from the perspective of the minimizer player. The minimum wants the minimum score. So this node right here has value less than or equal to 8 once that's evaluated. Now you evaluate that. Well, if the minimizer is right there, it knows it gets a 7 if it comes there. It just goes that way, right? It makes that choice. Now you feed that back up to the maximizer. The maximizer understands it will do better than or equal to 7. So you evaluate this right here, this 3. And now that 3 tells the maximizer, if I go there, the minimizer will go there. So that'd be stupid for me to go down that path. So the maximizer chops off that entire branch of the tree. And that can cut off a massive part of the chess tree. Okay, That's the alpha beta part of the mini max algorithm. Now, continuing on, you get to throw out that evaluation, that evaluation, you chuck out that entire part of the tree. I mean, you can do this if yourself if you like. But the point is you take off a massive chunk of the tree. And empirically, it was found that you don't need to go that deep into the tree to be really good at chess. You don't have to ferret yourself all the way down there. You look advanced. You look far enough in advance to become a threat. And that turns out to be like seven levels of depth. So that's how Deep Blue beat Kasparov. It was not by playing chess in a clever way. I would argue that there was absolutely no artificial intelligence present in Deep Blue whatsoever. Um, by the clock, let's see. <laughs> I was looking at that one the whole time. I was like, oh, let's see. Oh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually out of time. Let me make one last point, though, um, and then I'll hand it over to Charlie to shut things down. Um, but the um, AlphaGo, so I wanted to just mention that. This is a very simplistic way that AlphaGo was beaten. It was not by Deep Blue. That's why people, it was not in the methods that Deep Blue used. That's why people predicted that it would take 10 years. Have you heard this? So the, the Go complexity is, is much more than chess. It's 10 to the 184. A few slides back, I had Go's complexity right there. That was that number. So it's much more complicated than chess. They thought it would take 10 more years because that's how much computing power was needed. But as I said earlier, I mentioned earlier, I think we're going to see a resurgence of popularity of neural networks because essentially that was kind of the core of the way that AlphaGo beat Lisa Dole. Picture these two functions. People were very clever and decided, let me tell the machine how to play Go by this function called capital G. And I'm going to throw some parameters into it that tell it how to play the game in some way. I don't really know what they mean. And I'm, again, I'm being very simplistic. A machine can play Go millions of times faster than a human. Who plays Go in here? How long does it take to play a game of Go? How long, how many can you play in a day? Okay, so AlphaGo can play about a billion a day. So AlphaGo said, I'm going to pit this strategy against that one and see which one wins. Average over a billion games. Keep the one that wins. Repeat. Keep the one that wins. Repeat. Keep the one that wins. Repeat. Keep the one that wins. It's now got more experience paying, playing Go than you will ever have. So the winning function was the one that it kept. 
and that's how it beat Lisa Dole. It's almost like an accident. But again, there's no intelligence there, artificial or otherwise. It was clever human programming that did that. And I'll end on that note. Beautiful, man. Listen, uh, when they ask you questions, just repeat the questions so people can hear them. You got it. You can pick them out. Okay. So, uh, questions, please. Uh, yes, sir, for front row. Is that bigger than a Google? Oh, yeah. Bigger than a Google? Well, I don't know. Is it? What is a Google? Is it a 10 to the 100? It'd be nice if it was a Google because Google deep mind beat. Yeah, yeah. Question, please. Yeah. A simple machine and a computer? I don't think there's any distinction between a machine and computer. For example, if you go outside, uh, Jessica Dean, wherever, there, there she is, she'll have you make a computer out of dominoes. And if that ain't a machine, well, <laughs> I guess dominoes aren't a machine, but you can make a computer out of dominoes. It's, it's like a kinetic cause and effect reaction. Anytime that's happening, you've got a machine. Thanks. Any others? Yes, please, up there. Can you say that again? Do you have to be a what? You have to be a good mathematician to be good at anything in life. <laughs> I, one more? Yeah, please. Kinda. You should talk to me afterwards. But basically, Girdle showed that there was a statement that said, this statement is false. So if you could prove that statement is false, then you just, <laughs> right, you just, you have a paradox. Girdle essentially showed that those exist, basically. But I'm glad for the question. You should, you should study that. It's, it's fantastic mathematics. Thanks. Thanks, Hal.